So welcome here, everyone. Really glad you can all come out and listen to Mariah's thesis reading. This is a relatively unusual location for us to do this in December, and partly for that reason we've allowed the unorthodox uh, seated version of, uh, of a thesis reading. <laughs> Don't think, those of you who are destined to do your thesis readings in April, that you will be accorded such freedoms. <laughs> Is it also because it's December that she's allowed to have watch I'm It has been, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Mariah on this project. She's a very independent uh, thinker and, and writer and someone who uh, amazingly, and I say amazing because it isn't due to, uh, let's say, the early work being done, uh, it's still easy to have confidence in her uh, in, in spite of that uh, because she knows her topic well, she uh, has an understanding which is uh, really good at being theoretical and real life at the same time and I think you will hear that as she shares and I'm sure you'll appreciate I'm throwing all these SHs in because I'm just building up to it that it's all about shame. <laughs> just trying to be um, so she will talk about shame, uh, and I think that you'll hear that there is a, a very practical message in, uh, in what she's going to share with us today, and I think it's very fitting that she gets a chance to, to share this work with us. So I'm going to say a prayer for her. <laughs> So God, I am uh, very grateful for the way that you've walked alongside of Mariah as she's done this work and thought through these questions as she thinks about uh, the dynamics of shame, as she ponders the way in which we tend to all need to be released from some of the ways in which shame holds us back. So I pray that you would um, be very present with her now as she speaks, help her to um, remember all that she knows and to uh, share it with us uh, clearly and, and confidently. And uh, just bless her and all of us during this time. Amen. <laughs> um, I'm going to just right off the bat do my acknowledgments. <coughs> because everybody does that and I think they're important. <laughs> um, firstly, I have to express immense gratitude to my thesis supervisor, Walter Kissin. Without your guidance, direction, and gentle motivational prodding, <laughs> <laughs> which it is safe to say was even on more than one occasion, um, <coughs> alongside your encouragement and not infrequent good humor teasing, I would not have been able to accomplish this task. I cannot thank you enough for all the work you put into making this thesis happen, and not only that, but for your investment in me throughout my time at SSU. <coughs> I thought I can make it. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Although it's strange to think that my time as your student has come to an end, I take solace in remembering that my time as your friend can carry on. <laughs> um, thanks must also go to my second reader, Rachel Barham. For not only putting up with my emotional breakdowns, <laughs> but um, for helping to ensure that my sometimes scattered ideas and thoughts came across in a coherent way. I really appreciate the time and effort and care you put into helping me, and I'm so thankful for the clarity that your perspective provided. Oh. <laughs> as well, I have to thank Agnes for obliging a very desperate last minute request to look over my last chapter, <laughs> and for providing me with insight um, into how to articulate my ideas in ways that can make sense to other people, <laughs> and not just to myself. Um, I really love and appreciate you and all the time that you've, um, you've taken for me here. Um, also, where are you? Um, Kendall and Shelly for giving me a home and a safe place to return to every day. I've loved living in your house over the past few months. Your family has meant so much to me and I don't know how I would have made it through this semester without you. You've taken such great care of me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Lastly, to the incredibly dear friends that I have made in SSU and SCB communities. I have a very long list of names, but I won't <laughs> go into it. You have all contributed greatly to the person <coughs> I am today. Um, and thank you for opening your hearts and homes to me, for sharing your meals, memories, conversations, and laughter. 
for all the joy that these have brought into my life. <sighs> this has been a wonderfully formative place of healing and growth, and I'm so thankful for everyone who's been a part of it. So I'd like to pretend that the crying is done, but it's probably not. <laughs> 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 uh, so yeah, thank you all so much. Um, shame, it's weird to think about explaining shame because I've been so invested in it as a topic, like I can't remember what it's like to not really know that much about it. <laughs> <laughs> so in doing this, I hope that I'm not trying to leave too much to fill in the blanks, but also I'm trusting that because shame is such a universal experience that we can all kind of connect to. What I'm trying to say. <laughs> and heads up that I do best with questions. So if you have some, don't hesitate to ask. I'm not sure if this will communicate everything that I want. So I'm, I'm excited for questions. <laughs> um, I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, because I chose to look at shame Basically, my thesis is about shame and relationship. And because that's such a broad topic, I went into like a lot of different details about different things, <laughs> safe to say. Um, so now I'm not, I don't really cite any major particulars in what I've written out here, but I try to kind of give an overall perspective of what, sh like how shame works and how it affects relationships and how our relationships can help um, heal shame and make us shame resigned. Mm -hmm. So, here I go. <laughs> shame is difficult to study because of its innate secrecy. If we look into ourselves, we can see the depths of its reach. The roots of shame dig down into our most deep and personal secrets and fears. In attempts to protect ourselves from pain, which is part of the healthy function of shame, our shame puts up walls that separate us from others. These walls not only protect us from further hurt, but impede us from connecting and building meaningful relationships with others because we are hiding who, real, who we really are from people. It also affects our understanding of ourselves and what our shame is about. So I'm saying putting up walls makes it hard to even understand the shame itself. Um, the function of shame can evolve from being a healthy, protective social emotion, kind of guiding us into the people that we do want to be, and become inhibitive um, when we don't really know like where our standards are coming from. Like we don't really know who we want to be and why we want to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, part of processing shame is understanding how shame functions. This can be especially difficult when we have deeply hidden both our shame and the sources of our shame within ourselves. Many shame researchers say that although shame has eluded a clear definition for some time, it is nonetheless a very a powerful force in our lives and behavior. As such, it is important to explore what the word shame entails and how it works within us. So I've kind of sectioned things to, as categories. Um, so yeah, this, is, this next part is talking about pain we feel in shame. Uh, shame is such a powerful force because it is so very painful. <clears throat> it involves a feeling that who we are is wrong, disgusting, loathsome, or inadequate. It makes us feel like everyone is watching. <laughs> <laughs> and criticizing us. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it makes us want to escape, disappear, or cease to exist. It involves a panicked sense of self-consciousness. Shame manifests itself in blushing or a red face, which I feel like I'm doing now, so I don't know if I can just be a human illustration. <laughs> <laughs> um, downcast eyes, slumped posture. <laughs> 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 Feelings of exposure or a feeling of worthlessness. Shame is the feeling that you are innately lacking or insufficient in some way. It is the perception that who you are is not enough. It feels like being unwillingly exposed and powerless to cover yourself up. Shame is so, far, so powerful <laughs> that it can manifest itself physically. It can literally be a very painful experience. So we can feel like anxiety and depression are all symptoms that are often connected with pain. I think I get to that later. But it's just, it intrigues me actually that it's so powerful that we can have like physiological reactions to it. 
Um, the next section is on the secrecy of shame. Shame is self-perpetuating because it is able, mm, sorry, shame is self-perpetuating in that it's able to keep itself alive through secrecy. One of the innate traits of shame is that it wants us to be hidden. It means to shield us from exposing ourselves to ridicule, rejection, and pain. This protective tendency of shame becomes detrimental to the healing of unhealthy shame, which I kind of mentioned before is like when it's, you're not sure how you're being navigated to be better. Um, yeah, it let's see, becomes detrimental to the healing of unhealthy shame in its attempts to separate and protect us further from painful exposure um, because it also protects us from opportunities for catharsis, empathy, and healing. Um, and this is defenses against shame. Because shame is so terrifying and painful, we seek out ways to defend ourselves and avoid further shame experiences. Some of these are ways, sorry. <laughs> Some of these ways involve things we do to ourselves, and some involve things we do to others. Most, however, affect both ourselves and those surrounding us. Um, are the following is a few examples of the ways in which people attempt to cope with shame, protecting themselves from further um, experiences, or trying to fill a void it has created within them. So I list in my actual chapter, I go through a few more than these, but I've just got, I think, about three um, kind of ways that we try to cope. And the first is denial. Denial is the most basic defense against shame. Several of the other defense mechanisms that will be mentioned, <coughs> not here, <laughs> could probably fit under the umbrella of denial because it can manifest itself in many different ways. It can be pretending that one does not feel ashamed or pretending that what is triggering shame does not exist. So the context would be just denial, I don't feel ashamed, or I have nothing to be ashamed of. Um, the creation of a false self, so putting on a front for other people. Um, being arrogant and pretending um, or having shamelessness, so just pretending that there's no way that you can even be made to feel shame are all forms of denial. Perfectionism is another defense against shame and an attempt at becoming a person who has no reason to feel shame. So it sort of fits in the denial category. Perfectionism is the desire to be completely flawless and to fix or remove parts of ourselves that we see as imperfect. The dangerous thing about perfectionism is that it inevitably sets us up for failure. Perfectionism backfires when we realize that we are unable to live up to the personas and standards of perfection that we've created for ourselves. This failure will inevitably result in stronger feelings of self-hatred, self anxiety, separation from the self, and other negative shame traits and responses. Move on. As is often the result of striving for perfection, jealousy and envy may drive us to lash out at others whom we feel are threatening to breach the walls of our shame. Pointing out the flaws of others is a way for us to try to bring the people we are envious of down from the pedestals that our envy has placed them on. Because we feel intrinsically insufficient when we compare ourselves to others and find ourselves lacking, we will try to hide ourselves from the potential ridicule of others by drawing attention to their lack. People with internalized or unhealthy shame feel that if attention remains on the flaws of others, they themselves can escape attack. And these are just a few of the examples of how we attempt to defend ourselves. Others include rage, isolation, power grabbing, clinging to other people. There's, <laughs> there are so many ways that I was like, kind of questioned all behavior that I saw from everyone. <laughs> like, all I could see was this, so it was, it was intense. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that there's a really uh, important tie between shame and addictions, but because I'm only kind of sweeping with a wide brush, I'm not going to talk about it here, but it's really, <laughs> they're quite connected. Talk about it in your thesis? I do talk about it in my thesis, yeah. Um, basically, well, I guess I'll talk about it here. Um, <laughs> it's like that. Um, shame might not necessarily what be what brings us into an addiction, but um, it plays a major role in what keeps us in addictions and eventually kind of can become what the addiction's about as opposed to whatever first brought you into it. So, okay, I 
think I, I keep trying to introduce these things, but then the next sentence introduces them themselves. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with that. <laughs> um, from everything that has been gathered about the nature of shame thus far, we see that at the most basic level, shame is about relationship. relationship. <laughs> we feel shame is a broken connection. We feel that we are flawed and that these flaws will separate us from others. In our attempts to rebuild the connection, these connections, we try to separate ourselves from the parts of ourselves which we feel are blocking our connections. And then if we are left, okay, sorry, then we are left feeling detached from others and from ourselves. These feelings of isolation, loneliness, and rejection create a wake of negativity, self-consciousness, self-hatred, jealousy, paranoia, anxiety, anger, depression, and many other symptoms. And these only widen the chasms of shame that isolate us. In, our attempts, in attempts to cover our shame, we create personas and adopt behaviors that we hope will make us feel protected and give us a sense of relief over the pain we feel. We turn to perfectionism, addiction, denial, people-pleasing, arrogance, and more. Yet, these things only cover up our shame and do not fill the void we feel inside of ourselves. We need to build a bridge across the chasm that divides us from the relationships that we need in order to overcome shame. Brene Brown explains that shame resilience is the best way to cease feeling overwhelmed by shame. Um, I'm not sure if I point this out later, but I'll say it now just in case. <laughs> um, that shame resilience isn't about getting rid of feelings of shame because that's kind of impossible. <laughs> um, or you can try and you can be in denial and you can be angry and you can try to control, but then it doesn't really work out so well. <laughs> um, so she kind of sees it, and I do explain it later, as just a way to process shame instead of letting it overwhelm you. Um, and some key parts of that are, of shame resilience, are vulnerability, empathy, and connection. So I'll talk about those now. Vulnerability is often thought of as weakness. It is being in a state of exposure and having susceptibility to attack, or being susceptible to attack. However, vulnerabil vulnerability is a vital component in overcoming shame. Shame wants us to remain defensive and protect ourselves. And while this protection ensures that no one will be able to get near um, our shame triggers or the things we feel ashamed of, it also ensures that we will never be able to heal from our shame experiences. Intentionally choosing vulnerability opens us up to the healing power of relational connection, and this connection puts into perspective our feelings of shame by creating a bond over common humanity. Um, if we want to minimize our feelings of shame in the long term, we need to practice empathy, which is an engage, or sorry, we need to practice empathy, engaging with it as a recipient as well as being, as making conscious efforts to empathize with others. This will not necessarily be possible while living in the fresh intensity of shame-induced panic, but can be part of the process of dealing with shame after they occur, feelings of shame after they occur. Developing empathy is a key part of shame resilience, and while we may not feel in control of our shame responses in the moment, they are triggered, an intentional pursuit of it, I'm kind of repeating myself, but <laughs> um, in the processing of our experiences will help us move, move forward towards shame resilience. Sh shifting our viewpoint through the acceptance of empathy allows us to see our situations from beyond our shame and to put shaming experiences into perspective. Um, and the next thing I talk about is recognizing our common humanity. <laughs> it is impossible for anyone to be perfect, but we consistently expect it of ourselves because of sociocultural messages of perfection delivered to us through our family and other social systems. Shame reminds us that we are in a struggle to be worthy of love and belonging, but empathy reminds us that in our struggles we are not alone. In understanding who we are in relation to our shame, there are a few key things to remember. We need to remember that we are all imperfect, that we are all expected to be more than we are, that we all crave relationship at the core of our beings, and that none of us want to be the cause of that disconnection. Brene Brown believes that shame resilience is the way to deal with our shame. Unlike our defense mechanisms, shame resilience does not involve an avoidance of shame, but rather a processing of shame, which takes away its overwhelming authority in our lives. The key traits of shame resilience, so again, I feel like I'm just blazing through this, probably because I am, <laughs> but uh, this is like, I don't know how many pages I would have been into my thesis at this point. 
Um, yeah, just that this is kind of an overarching concept that it's hard to engage with in a 30 minute kind of overview of something. Um, so then I'm just gonna go back into <coughs> the key traits of shame resilience as Brene Brown found them. Um, she interviewed, like, I think, a few thousand people, maybe at least a few hundred people, and um, kind of took the key components of her stories of people who she found to be shame resilient, and then these were the traits that they had that she found to be effective in being shame resilient. <laughs> And the first is having the courage to be vulnerable about our imperfections and sharing our stories. Also to give and receive empathy, as discussed before, and recognizing and acknowledging when we feel shame. Um, oh, I keep just wanting to interject with everything. Sorry, I won't. Um, then the last one is understanding and accepting our limitations and shortcomings. <sighs> anyway. I digress. <laughs> in essence, shame resilience involves an intentional choice to make oneself vulnerable to the empathy of others through the sharing of our stories of shame within healthy and safe relationships. It also involves keeping in mind that not all feelings of shame are necessarily well-founded and remembering that we will never be able to fulfill all of the expectations we set upon ourselves. Um, in this, it is vital to recognize the core spiritual e spiritual essence of all people. We need to see that what makes us human is our essential need and desire to be known and loved, to be in relationship with others. Ooh, I'm already here. Cool. Um, <laughs> I had this really awesome idea that I would tell a story, like one of my own shaming experiences, to kind of just somewhat illustrate the points. And so you can be shame resilient? So you like to be shame resilient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I trust everyone. This is a safe place. Um, but I don't, I don't so much like tell the whole story. I think I tried and then I was like, this isn't doing what I want. Um, but I basically just wanted to look at the effects of it, of my experience. Um, and then, yeah, I can just demonstrate how they connect to everything. Um, my shame experience is hard to share because it doesn't feel like it should have been a big deal. It is not a story of physical or sexual abuse or trauma. You know, I wouldn't be done crying. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, I didn't have my heart broken, and it wasn't the result of an unstable home environment, though these are all major contributors to shame. But it is simply the story of being made to feel small by someone who needed to feel big. Um, so basically, I was just made fun of as a kid, or a young person, like I was about 15 or so, and just had a person in my life who was really consistently berating me and just being really horrible to me. Um, I don't I hate to like talk crop. <laughs> <laughs> Drink some water. Drink some water. Um Yeah, I was just brutal. Um <laughs> I don't know. I kind of wrote down some of the things that like specifically I felt, but I just remember feeling really, really angry and overwhelmed and like I remember being so consumed by trying to get this person back and trying to like fight for myself. And I didn't write it here, but I still like have some of those responses, like mm -hmm. making really, like cutting jokes at people and things like that. But anyway, this is, let's look at what, let's look at how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this, Kid and I were in kind of the same social circle. Obviously, I wouldn't say we were friends, <laughs> but we probably would be categorized that way. Um, and in this group, everybody, we'd all joke around all the time and, you know, make fun of each other. But this um, boy, child, man, <laughs> teenager, <laughs> uh, he just would, like, he would target me for 
and just comments that were harsh and mean spirited and not just like joking and fun. And it was like it, <laughs> painful, <laughs> obviously. Um, let's see. Yeah, he um, his joking was mean spirited and hateful, but he veiled them as harmless so they continue so that it could continue to go unchecked. Um, we were all in this group because we were in uh, this mentorship kind of program. <laughs> it's <was> funny. <laughs> 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 but he was really smart, <laughs> and so he knew how to get away with just like digging into me and cutting into me without it being ever enough to get a reaction from like our mentors. <laughs> um, and he was also really popular within our group, so he could get anybody to just laugh at me and and like embarrass me or whatever. Um, so over the years, I was slowly made to feel like I was incompetent and that nothing I could do was good enough because it was either making fun of something I did just naturally or making some fun of something I did to try and defend myself. Um, yeah. It's weird and cool to process it now, but it was really bad. Um, I felt like I was alone because of how popular he was in the group of people and because the people who I had turned to about it were also like his good friends. And so they didn't really want to like intervene in any way because, I, and part of it is too that, why is he doing this? Like he's a hurting person as well. He's not like he's some villain who just try and make my life miserable for the same bit. But <laughs> I see that now. I didn't really see that then. <laughs> um, yeah, but a big thing for me was that I didn't, I couldn't probably have recognized it as shame, what I was feeling, until maybe I came here and just was kind of introduced to shame as an outspoken topic, um, just coincidentally. But <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I kind of have been all over the place on this. Um, oh yeah, and then I make a big jump <laughs> to something totally unrelated at first. <laughs> um, so maybe it's because of that experience, I am so just easily drawing connections to things, but um, I don't know. <laughs> in my class with Agnes, we were reading Don Mackay's um, a piece he wrote called Baylor Twine, and I made this painting about it. And every time I try to explain it, I don't really explain it well enough. So hopefully this will be the exception. <laughs> um, um, I wrote a little bit out, so I'll read this and then if it doesn't make sense, maybe that's just too bad. <laughs> um, okay. Go with it. <laughs> Baylor Twine tells the story of author John Mackay discovering a raven that has been shot and strung up on a fence by a piece of Baylor Twine. Um, in the story, Mackay mourns the objectification of the raven, particularly because he recognizes the beauty of its spirit, which he refers to as its wilderness and sees that it has been broken by a person taking advantage of its vulnerability. The raven's wilderness, or spirit, made itself vulnerable to contact, both good and bad, through a choice to be available for relationships with other life. Um, although this choice is what made it available, or made the raven available to be abused, it is also what made it available for Makai to come and cut it down, helping to free the raven or this, the raven spirit from suffering and honor it, honor its existence as a fellow being. Um, so this is a little bit scattered. That makes sense. That man. makes sense? Okay, good. Because <laughs> it made sense in my head for so long. But. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean that makes sense, but I kind of went through this process of drawing parallels between um, how I was feeling and how I saw this um, raven. So I don't know if you can see from here, but there's so there's the outer part of the raven, and then inside is this an outline of, of a raven, which is supposed to represent its wilderness or its spirit. And I really like the word the word wilderness, just because it kind of has that this constant like unknowing that you don't really you can never really fully. Um, fully engaged with it, but it 
is choosing to be avail like it, it limits itself and chooses to be available for relationship by um, taking home, he says, homemaking in this body. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is a parallel that I made, and it kind of wraps up my presentation. And so after this, I'll be open for questions. Because I was vulnerable, I was misused and made into an object for another person's attempt to be significant. I was used as a vehicle for jokes and degradation to make this boy feel big. But that same vulnerability is what allowed the bale of twine of my shame to be cut and the wilderness within me, the raven, to be relieved of the burden of being made to feel that I was a non-being. My vulnerability to other relationships is what allowed my spirit to receive the healing balm of empathy, which told me that I was not really an object to be used for someone else's gain, gain, but that I was a spiritual being made for connection, and that that needed had been betrayed. It's not that the shaming events didn't occur, they did, and it was excruciating, but my wilderness was available to receive the restorative gift of healing through my vulnerability. I needed for a figure, for a Mackay figure, to find me and cut me down from the place hanging on the fence, to recognize and honor my wilderness, to empathize with my humanity and provide a new place for me to heal. In a sense, I was unreachable as I hung up there on a fence, um, strung up by my feelings of shame, but I was vul vulnerable enough to be reached by people who recognized our mutual humanity. Mackay's act of cutting the twine is the act of intentionally engaging in relationships. He helped to release the raven from its place of suffering and restore its wilderness. This act is what I have experienced in my healing relationships, in the healing relationships I've been a part of. People have recognized my humanity and empathized with me in a state of brokenness, helping to restore my spirit back to a place of resilience. She was sharing was that these these uh, gown things, you know, probably somebody invented them at one point to give a little bit of protection from the vulnerability and shame when you, <laughs> when you get up here and stuff. No, I was kind of tempted to just. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but Mariah didn't let that stop her from from being very vulnerably mm -hmm. present, which was beautiful and uh, and a great example of that shame resilience, mm -hmm. which has been growing so strong in you. Thanks. Thanks. So great time for for questions. What uh, she uh, she's thrown out that she loves questions. So uh, what would you what would you like, <coughs> um, Pete and then Matt? Um, I just wondered if you could give a little bit of uh, objective description about the essay. In other words, like um, maybe the chapter titles, things um, like uh, of of your dis dissertation or your thesis. An objective description. Yeah, I, I just mean like uh, how many chapters? Oh, uh, like, what were the chapters? <laughs> just I, I love your presentation by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I kind of it was hard for me to think about presenting because everything is so interconnected and um, anyway, but I did try to divide it up in my thesis so that I have four chapters. Um, my first chapter basically just gives an overview of what shame is and how it functions, and um, a few examples of how we try to defend ourselves um, from feeling it again. And then, I'm trying to remember my order, um, second chapter, <coughs> basically the next three chapters were about um, different aspects of relationship, like our interpersonal relationships, so how I um, connect with other people and how that affects, you know, cause and, cause and effect of shame and how you can find healing in those. And then, as well, the next chapter goes into your relationship with yourself, because shame is such a personal emotion, and because it kind of causes you to want to divide yourself and things like that, it's a relationship that I think is really important. And then the third chapter talks about um, spirituality, and kind of your relationship with God, your, and your relationship with religion, and your relationship 
yeah, this one went a little bit crazy. <laughs> and your relationship <laughs> with like other <laughs> spiritual beings. <laughs> and yeah, just kind of tied together that essentially, I think that relationship kind of is the point. <coughs> and it's also how we can get our <coughs> back to that point from feeling shamed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so you're a psychology major, right? Yeah. Okay, just <laughs> And this is a psychology thesis, I'm guessing. Yes. <laughs> um, you guesses, I know. Um, so I obviously like. I mean, it's not like you haven't used the word relationship, but relational. Relational is not a word. So <laughs> I have not used that. Um, sure, I'll give it to you. Um, yeah. So obviously, it's a. It, it strikes as a very relational um, topic. So I mean, I'm wondering. I know you talked a tiny bit about physiological things. Um, would you say that there is like, well I guess it's kind of a two-part question, um, <coughs> would you say that this is more like, that there are like, you know, some interesting things you found that are like, have scientific, um, like strong scientific implications that are more like on the, um, I don't know if I want to say like bio, you know, yeah. bio side of psychology, or would you say this is more just like something that has maybe implications for counseling side of psychology? I don't I know, you can <laughs> totally just... Shoot just every talk about something yeah, totally unrelated. <laughs> um, I personally didn't dig into too much into too much of the um, like biopsychological side of things. Like I did find it really interesting that like it's there are studies that shame does have physiological effects on you. Um, yeah, but I think most significantly, my perspective would have um, weight in counseling, but also just life like I don't think it, I'm not trying to write to counselors about like how to help people feel less shame but it's like how to be alive <laughs> right. it was yeah it proved to be challenging to write that <laughs> right. um, yeah so there probably are a lot more than what I right I mean like I'm, I guess m- more I'm asking like you probably would feel like it's hard to tie in with academics as much when it's so relational, you know? So I'm just kind of like wondering how you did it. Yeah, well there there was a lot of studies about like people's behaviors and like I really don't mention them here, but it's just like there was so much talking about, you know, how shame makes someone feel this way. And it, it's weird because it's this, all this really relational feeling, emotional stuff, but it has um, like repercussions that are like measurable. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> qualitative and qualitative and quantitative. Another psych major. <laughs> 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 I have a question. Yeah. I don't know if I can ask like okay, so I'm just trying to can I word this, but so we've all you're saying that we've all felt shame. Mm-hmm. And so when you say resilience, you're like kind of how you can overcome that, right? Yeah. So, is that what you mean? Yeah, I use the word overcome, but it's kind of nuanced maybe (laughs) like obviously you saw me crying I feel like I am a shame resilient person but that doesn't mean that your pain goes away that's what I was was getting at so it's you could like these are the steps that you can take but it's kind of how to function with that like to live like you're saying it's about living so we are all we're going to continue we may experience that yeah it's able to kind of will probably yeah (laughs) so it's like learning how to I guess like Would you say embrace it and just be able to live? Yeah, I would. I would say that kind of learning how to, um, in a sense, save yourself but save each other um, from being total victims to (laughs) shame, because it is such a like a strong drive. One, well, a few of the sources talk about it being like a stronger drive for our behavior than like our sex drive or Mm -hmm. anything else. So, yeah. So is that how you? tying kind of spiritual side of them, how like that can be such a big part of sorry, I uh, no, see like where you're going, but I don't. <laughs> I wonder I mean maybe in response to the last one, if you say a little bit of what you say in your last chapter about uh, how religion helps or hurts that distinction. Yeah, like okay, I'm trying to think of how to say this. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. I like it. I really feel like I kinda know this stuff, so um <laughs> Yeah, for if I'm looking at the religious um, thing, there was a lot of studies about religion either being a source of shame or a source of healing, and there is basically a distinction between religious rules and spirituality, 
Um, so you can be in a religious system and be, you know, spiritually engaged, and um, it's great, and you know you're going to feel hurt, but you feel this sense of connection with God and with the people around you, and so it, you can kind of be shame resilient in that. But there's also religious systems and people in religious systems who don't feel that kind of spiritual connection, who feel like they're there to prove that they're good enough, they're there to be a good person, mm -hmm. they're there to make sure that they measure up to what so-and-so said mm -hmm. that they need to be. And it's not about, yeah, it's basically grace, having grace for yourself and for other people and understanding that there is grace for you mm -hmm. or feeling like you just have to keep trying and you'll never make it and it's hopeless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't know if that answers your question. No, I don't know if that's where you're no, going. No, it's good. I don't think I've ever, when you think of shame, you think of like, oh, you did something wrong, like you kind of feel, mm -hmm. but I don't think it, like how much it actually affects yeah. our lot. Like, it's such a huge word, actually. Yeah, yeah. it really, yeah. it really is. <laughs> <laughs> you read a whole new stuff. Repeat the word. Yeah, just a quick comment is that I just read a book by Eric Fromm on psychoanalysis and religion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he, he d makes the same distinction, the, the religion that helps and the religion that hurts. Mm -hmm. And he calls it uh, authoritarian religion, which he thinks is the thing that kills the human spirit. And a huma humanitarian or humanistic religion that actually, with through empathy, allows us to become more who we are. Yeah. So, so yes. I liked his terms for that. Yeah, I had read another book of his that, The Art of Loving, it felt really awesome carrying it around and had like carnations on the front end. Um, but yeah, it, I agree with that. And it's kind of, other people use terminology like institutionalized religion or basically, yeah, just rigid um, rules-based systems versus engaged spirituality, which is what I kind of referred to it as. Yeah, thanks. But yeah. All right. I'm just wondering, what made you choose this topic specifically for your thesis? Well, as you can see, it was pretty personal for me. Um, I don't know, I think there was something I saw maybe in 2011 or 10. There was like those when Brene Brown was first kind of getting out there as a person. Um, she did this TED talk about shame. And I just was fascinated and it kind of helped put some vocabulary to what I was like feeling and it's weird actually like where oh Shelly's not here I was looking in my yes, <laughs> oh you are <laughs> <laughs> um I was telling her Shelly the other day that I was looking in my journal for a quote that I wanted and it was like freaking me out because I was reading like I basically walked through like this whole journey mostly in my time being here and it was like freaking me out I was like I'm using the exact words that I wrote about but this is from two years ago like yeah it's crazy <laughs> so I don't know I guess just knowing that it was so personal for me, but then also as just kind of starting out, realizing that it's that personal for everybody. Mm. And just like, <laughs> how insane that is. Hey, uh, Steve. Um, <laughs> pardon me if you did directly mention this in your uh, thesis presentation. Uh, <laughs> you started talking about personas and stuff, and I got lost in the abstract for, I don't know. <laughs> you scared already of your <laughs> But it's interesting when you talk about shame because, first of all, I'd like to know what you think about how shame simply doesn't, when you experience shame, shame dictates or seems to dictate or rule over you and uh, impede you from actually acknowledging it as shame, as actually identifying it as shame. It identifies itself as something else, which seems to lead to your symptoms of arrogance and perfectionism yeah. and an askew sense of self-worth. Um, so, uh, I mean, what do you think, do you how, much, <laughs> how much we enable shame or how much shame becomes, or whether shame becomes this own independent being within our self-consciousness. We isolate it from ourselves so much that it gains its own sort of rules and distinctions. Yeah, I think it's definitely both. Um, but one, <laughs> classic SSU answer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> when, like I talked about in the intrapersonal chapter, like about yourself, um, I talked about kind of following 
a chain of your emotions down to what their core motivation is. Um, so I used uh, um, emotion focused therapy is the thing. Uh, maybe I, tell me if I'm like deviating too far from what you're talking about. Um, so basically like, for instance, if we look at my kind of tearful example, <laughs> I just felt really angry and I couldn't put a word to it. Mm -hmm. Like I felt so angry, I felt like I was being betrayed. And so then, you know, you follow that back. Like why, what about this is making me feel angry? And then, you know, you kind of go through like, well, I felt angry because I was, you know, they took my voice away from me. Like, and then why did that make you angry? Because I, like, I'm a person. I feel like I should do that. And then, so you kind of follow it back and then you can realize what's at the core of what you're feeling. So if you're not able to necessarily engage with the label of shame right away, I think you can still, like, get there. And especially with um, the help from other people. Um, so I feel like I kind of addressed what you said, but that I deviated. Uh, yeah, I definitely understand <laughs> what you're saying. It's, it's this weird go between shame kind of encourages you to enable it. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah. if I had played your words into my words, it's this idea that it's not just shame acting as an independent mm -hmm. organism within your uh, psyche. It's that it encourages you to keep ignoring it and it gets stronger mm -hmm. the more you give it that power and exactly. you give it that authority. Yeah. And I guess that's how I've always thought of shame. It's the idea that there has to be some higher authority mm -hmm. kind of casting judgment on you for you to feel a sense of shame. Yeah. It doesn't really make sense for a lesser power to impact, for you to feel that a lesser power is judging you because uh, it is shame, <laughs> enacting shame within you or evoking that? I think it also has to do with like the power you give to voices like that. So, mm. like, hmm. So with, say, the religious example, you know, if you're in a church where you feel comfortable to not be, you know, you feel like the rules of the church aren't the rules for your life, necessarily. Like, you understand that there's something more important that you're living for than specific things, specific rules, like you have an engaged spirituality or an engaged understanding of your existence. <laughs> um, but if you don't have that, if you kind of are looking to these rules, you're giving them the authority to make you feel that shame, mm. which is hard. <laughs> I think it's also what you said about secrecy. <coughs> that was exactly mm -hmm. along the line mm -hmm. of what Steve was saying, too, that yeah. it's part of the trick that keeps it. Yeah, because it's kind of designed to, to keep you safe, but then it just ends up keeping itself safe and then making, just becoming toxic in some ways. Sym symbiotic. Yeah. Yeah, because kind of sim non. Right. Sorry, I have to stand. So sitting is killing us apparently. Um, <coughs> oh. Yeah. Um, first off, just really well done, obviously. I think. Um, <coughs> uh, also, especially since you, you know, the, said to people that have often asked about, you know, the, and you say, well, how did you choose your topic? Anybody who chooses a topic that can be described in one word is very courageous. <laughs> <laughs> like shame, or like wisdom, or <laughs> grace, or like, like, oh, community. Or if you can describe your thesis in one, what your thesis is about in one word, you are in deep trouble. Because <laughs> right? those rabbit holes go very, very, they're infinite, really. <laughs> so uh, congratulations and well done on, on, the, on at least deciding how deep you are going to go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> And, uh, and not, not, you know, dragging us to China. Um, <laughs> so, also some great one-liners, uh, I must say. Here's two of my favorites. Shame is a panicked sense of self-consciousness. I'm going to take that one away. And, uh, and I'm actually considering rewriting Rick's third law from this one. We, we feel intrinsically insufficient. I love that one. It's a great one. We feel it. As opposed to everybody always thinks they're in trouble, which is how it how it's stated now. Um, <coughs> so, also I got a question. So, so finally the questions. First question: um, the, the 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 painting. Where where does it come from? It's. Um, who, who did it? Where where? Oh, I did it. You did it. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. I, I, I might have <laughs> missed no, that part, that. but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I did it for um, Agnes's class which I just totally dug into this writer, Don Mackay, like this piece that we read. Um, 
Yeah, because I was fascinated by the, um, he's talked about homemaking, but just by the kind of intentional act of vulnerability w um, to connect with people, sorry, intentional act of vulnerability for the purpose of connecting with people with the understanding <laughs> that that's kind of the point of existing. Um, yeah, so it's basically deciding that it's worth the risk to limit yourself. It's worth the risk to <coughs> put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and can you give me the significance of the fact that it's painted on a door? Well, Agnes actually probably worded that the best. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I maybe subconsciously saw that, but I guess pointed it out, and I was like, oh, genius. Just that, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're making a gateway for <laughs> a, a relationship. Right. Uh, that's what I figured it was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't lost on me. <laughs> the door. Um, okay, finally, finally the real question. Um, at one point there, you talked about uh, healthy versus unhealthy shame. And I'm wondering if you could sort of talk to what you think healthy shame is, and e if shame's even the right word to use for that. Yeah. Uh, like, is that something else? Whatever healthy shame, what could be called healthy shame, is that actually a different thing? Like, is, is there, uh, what, what does that look like? Would how, would you, how would you tell healthy shame from unhealthy shame? Yeah, <laughs> I'd be so into like a new term <laughs> for what, what I see, or what people have seen healthy shame to be. And like, I think Brene Brown said that she doesn't think any, hame, any shame is healthy. Yeah. And I don't even know. <laughs> Whole other topic, but. <laughs> um, so what I came to understand about healthy shame was that um, when we do have an understanding of the person we want to be, and it's like based on our own values and not about being accepted by others, that healthy shame kind of keeps you in line with that. So if I, let's, I had some examples. You did something against what you would believe yeah. to be, what you yourself. Like what I valued, you know, if I, I'm trying to think of a good concrete thing, like if I valued being, you could just say being honest to people. Or what about that example about the moms? Buying oh, clothes and yeah. the felt that that was okay. And I feel like that, that might be a little bit different. Oh, okay. But, um, <laughs> Never mind. but thanks. <laughs> um, uh, I like yeah. I'll say honesty because it's kind of easy. So if I want, I want to be an honest person. You know, I value being real with people, being genuine. Um, so when I tell a lie, I feel ashamed, and it's not that I think like I'm the worst human being in existence, but it's just that I recognize that I am a person who goes against what I want, who I want to be. Um, and then another component of healthy shame is that it's like, or versus talks of shame, is that healthy shame isn't this like, kind of almost constant, like really ready to be triggered thing. Like you can give yourself grace, like as much as I don't want to be telling little white lies, if I tell one, I'm not gonna just reel into this, you know, self-loathing cycle. It's like I understand that that was a mistake. I don't want to be a person who's dishonest, but I can take that with me. Mm -hmm. So almost like, you put, as you pointed out with the shame resilience, there are healthy and unhealthy ways to process. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the that's The tendency to shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mara, right. you explain that as like guilt and shame? Like the difference between the two? Oh, yeah, that's a cool distinction. So there could be guilt and shame both in that example. It's like, oh, I lied and I shouldn't have lied. Um, so guilt would just be like, oh, I shouldn't have lied. I'll make it right. But shame would be like, oh, I shouldn't have lied. Why did I want to tell that lie? I should just understand that I need to be honest. Like, to give a really brief, <laughs> um, something like that. Why did I tell that lie? And what about me? Was I trying to? Why did I value maybe protecting myself over being honest in that situation? I don't know if that was good. <laughs> I can't remember if it made it into your uh, first chapter or not. But Eric Erickson, who you know, uh, you know, his first stage is, is trust versus shame, and one of the things that he says about honesty. Uh, or helpful on, on, on healthy shame is that healthy shame tends to happen naturally, like in the way that she said with honesty. Whereas unhealthy shame, as soon as a person is shamed, then it becomes a useless thing because because the secrecy mm -hmm. takes place, and then it, it doesn't. It, you would think that a person who would feel tons of shame would have their actions controlled, but usually it's the opposite because they're so busy always hiding. Mm -hmm. Everything that they do, they, it's all about not getting caught instead of not yeah. doing it. So. Mm -hmm. Rosie? Um, I 
don't know if I can formulate it into a perfect question, but hopefully you'll have something to say. I fumbled through. <laughs> um, kind of with like nature versus nurture, um, and being, can you be, are people born with an innate sense of shame? Like, mm -hmm. we're all born simple, you know, like that kind of yeah. argument. Like, I think we've been sometimes in some churches taught that, like, are we born with shame, or is it something that you're shamed and then you feel shameful? From what I understood, <laughs> um, I would say that you are, are born with a capacity for healthy shame. And so, like, when you're, I think I read about this a little bit, when you're a kid and you do something that, you know, gets a negative response from your parents, you like, feel ashamed about it. So they, um, people have studied that and kind of see that it would make it an innate thing that it's like a response to discord or a response to like a lost connection, mm -hmm. even if it's just a momentary thing. Um, but then that, that can become something more. So it's like, yeah, a natural thing that can become something that is unnatural or, or unhealthy at least. Mm -hmm. Is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm wondering if the, the negative response that's not the shaming. That's just an natural response. Is a response, but then it's like your your reaction to the response. Yeah. I think that is the mm -hmm. shame. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Andy. I just want to say um, <clears throat> how brave I think you are to take such a personal topic and do such a great job on it. And um, I'm just. The way you use your own example and the way you talked about shame, I just wonder, is shame generally something as a result of an incident? And if that's the case, is it different than, say, an inferiority complex? Or is there some... Hmm. <laughs> I think... Just wondering. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just kind of talk and see what happens. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've read... Somebody, Nathan Sin, there's anyway, one of these two guys, Nathan Sinner Kaufman, um, talks about you know initial healthy shame, <coughs> but then when it becomes internalized, like so you can have an experience you know where you you receive a negative uh, response and then you react to it with shame, um, but then if you're in like an unhealthy family system or like all these things that can make you be have shame internalized or unhealthy, or toxic, like there's all these different terms for it, then you can develop something maybe like an inferiority inferiority complex. Okay. Um, yeah, just because it's the state of like feeling like you aren't good enough, you're not a good, like you're not a person, or you're less of a person than somebody else. You are intrinsically insufficient. Intrinsically is insufficient. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Nigel. Um, just noting uh, your example, Walter, about the irony of um, someone with a lot of shame in not actually getting them very far, you know, just kind of like impeding them. Um, you had mentioned something kind of along those lines in, uh, earlier this semester, Mariah, about uh, someone with like a larger amounts of shame actually equal lower empathy, mm -hmm. like less empathy for other people. And I found it really interesting. And now, if you can comment on this, I'm seeing, you know, kind of like a, you know, the symbolism of when you're strung up, you you don't really have a capacity to like, you know, m meet someone else's wilderness or, or mm -hmm. even cut them down. <coughs> so how do you feel like that? That I don't know that 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 condition of being um, shameful or feeling a lot of shame impeding you. How do you how do you go? I don't know. Yeah, that was something that I was really, I struggle with <laughs> as an idea because we talk about, well, empathy is the answer. And I wrote about it, <laughs> so I must know. Um, <laughs> but I talk about kind of an intentional, that's where I think you have to get a little bit practical about your shame and like <coughs> processing it. So even though you're not necessarily um, available to give or receive empathy, kind of like the, you go through something like emotion focused therapy or something where you really are looking at where you are and what brought you there and how to get, how to like dissect it. Okay. I remember one point where there was kind of like a chicken or egg 
feeling in one part of where you're writing. It was like, do you have to sort of stumble into a safe place where people enable you to be more vulnerable than you've been before? Or do you have to be vulnerable? Do you have to take the risk and be vulnerable first? Mm -hmm. And it, it's a little yeah. hard to, to know what, like, I don't know, does that address your question? Because it's... Yeah, it, it's, yeah. That, it's kind of like vice versa. Like, because you can't really be a, a safe place for someone like you're talking about. You can't really give empathy until you can receive it. And so I think I talk about kind of pursuing professional helping relationships when you felt like, when you really feel like you just can't do it organically. Um, just because people have a lot of the tools and resources that are able to help you work through that, that you wouldn't necessarily find in just a friendship when you're so caught up in that. You're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just got lost in a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> we probably have time for a couple more. Okay, so Elizabeth, and then uh, Dan. I just wanted to comment as well, like Andy, I think it takes a great deal of courage to share from the heart like that, so thank you. But um, you've really given me a lot to think about because in one way your description of shame is something that I haven't really thought about before because usually I associate shame with something that personally you have done that is mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is you can also feel shame when someone commits a crime against you, but even though they're committing the crime, you're paying for that time, in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm really thinking about that concept because really what you have is someone who is innocent, mm -hmm. but who's taking on that, that time that really they should be paying for because they're doing the crime mm -hmm. against you. So it's just a really interesting way of... Yeah, it is. I, that's another thing that I just thought was so <coughs> fascinating. Um, and I think why it makes it so important to understand your shame, because you know we talk about. I wrote about um, judgment today. I don't know if I mentioned judgment here, but it's like a major perpetrator of shame, which comes from feeling shamed. And so I think it just is about like, for me, just makes you second guess yourself. Like I thought I was fine, but I'm being told consistently like I'm not good enough. I'm a stupid. I'm an idiot. Like I'm ridiculous. You know. So. It can, then it's like, if, if I keep hearing this over and over, who am I those things? Like, and if I am, like, why can't I break out of that? Like, how come I can't? How come I'm not good enough to overcome this? And so, is this connected to those yeah, 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 just, just quick. quick. The, a, a thesis I read about this one said, just simply, and, and you've been saying it the same way, actually, almost exactly the same way. I did something wrong, I am something wrong. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the guilt and shame. So, so that in, once you're in, I am something wrong, you know, and then, then, and that could come because of repeated acts of I did something wrong, or it could come because of the thing that happened to you. People you know? being told, yeah. yeah. So, so, but once you're there, then, the, then you're in the state where so many good things are impeded. It's, I cannot do something right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I had a, a hum moment too as we were talking before about the healthy shame. Because I was thinking about that, I, I did something wrong, or I am something wrong. I wonder if healthy shame is, um, if I keep doing that, then I would become something wrong. Like, mm -hmm. In other words, yeah, this is something I that threatens my integrity. And so I'm just aware of the threat, as opposed to thinking I'm already. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know if you have an answer for this, but how, do you, how would you come alongside someone that you see is like acting out of shame, but maybe doesn't recognize it? and like help them see it for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to figure that out. <laughs> That's where I'm at right now. Yeah, I don't know, it's hard because it does have to do with the whole like connection thing and if they're not available for a connection, <laughs> I almost could quote Bill Murray, but I won't. Um, <laughs> hang up, try again later. <laughs> <laughs> I just think, yeah, it's hard because you can't make somebody realize, you know, their pain. <laughs> you have to, you can be available to them and try to be a source of healing for them, but, but there is, Brene Brown talks about the courageous act of choosing to be vulnerable mm -hmm. um, that you can't really force upon anybody. Mm -hmm. Do you think that sharing with someone, like how their actions have hurt you would sort of help? Get them up. I have experienced that. I think like just you choosing to be vulnerable enough to be like, hey, 
this is hurting me and it's basic, like it's a risk because they can take that and be like yeah but it's working fine for me so <laughs> it sucks to be you I guess <laughs> and that happens that's the thing that happens yeah but it also often I think can just grab people because often they are functioning out of hurt so when they realize they're hurting someone else mm -hmm. they, yeah. so it goes back to like yeah. the empathy mm -hmm. I would say so, and yeah, the vulnerability and willingness to be open and risking that they won't necessarily respond where you want. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if you could find and reread, there's these two brilliant lines, there's a lot of brilliant lines, but there's two <laughs> that I really notice when you're reading this out, um, about shame and then empathy, and how shame is, is the, I want your words on it because it was so good, um, how shame is at its core relational telling us that we that we, um, how desperately we need we one here. relationship. Yeah. Um, but then, then the empathy bit, do you know what that is? Oh, is it like, um, shame tells us something like, shame tells us that we are geared towards relationship mm -hmm. um, and that we're hurting maybe, and empathy tells us that we don't have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I that's brilliant. Yeah, I was. Yeah, they're both, they're both about relationship. Mm -hmm. They're both, and so shame is this can be a signal. Yeah, exactly. How, how important this, these relationships are. Mm -hmm. um, but then empathy can bridge that mm -hmm. gap and mm -hmm. disconnect that we've experienced. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's give the last question to Laura. Well, this wasn't, it's not a question, um, but uh, again, I, I'm so grateful that you've done this, Mariah, and that you've been vulnerable in sharing it with us today. I think it's a really huge gift to our community. What, what I wanted to say was, uh, I think, it, partly in response to Naomi's question about how do you help someone that's operating out of shame, the ways that I've been helped were times when someone has provided a totally safe place for me, mm -hmm. even in the midst of my lashing out at them. And I think that's rather than, for me, rather than focusing on the behavior or the fact that you hurt yourself, if you can just be, uh, find the grace to be a safe place yeah. for the person, then all those bombs can go off, <coughs> and, you know, and then they, then the healing is, be, can begin. And, and I think then a person is free to see, you know, in, in the safety of that place, a person is, is free. You, you naturally don't want to hurt someone that has, is caring about you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think it, that is amazing, <laughs> and it comes kind of coupled with just us. Mm -hmm. What am I trying to say? Setting up those boundaries in yourself that will not let you, as a strong person or as the safe place, to not let yourself kind of be fooled by these, you know, lashings out and not take them personally, mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. because then you don't get to be a safe place for anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, clearly from these questions, you uh, you really did touch a place where all of us can relate. So uh, thank you for leading us on this journey. Mm -hmm. okay.